Good morning, everybody. Our theme this morning is the second in our series on spiritual fitness. Commitment to teamwork. Commitment to teamwork. I think it was in 2017 that I received a telephone call from ZDF, the second German national television company, which developed into a research interview and went on for about 20 minutes. It was the last question that caused the problem. My answer threw the interviewer completely. It made everything that she had worked on up to that point in the interview valueless and unusable. My answers to her questions on the world political situation, on the German economy, on issues of social and personal concern, and so on, had stimulated her interest in her mind, but it led to absolutely nothing, because the last question was, how and when did you become a German citizen? And because at that point in 2017, I had had to say, sorry, but I am not a German national. It was just one question. But it was the critical question. It was the question I could not answer to her satisfaction. So she said in her best German, thank you and goodbye. This is not a research survey question this morning, but it has the same significance. If we get stuck on this one, have we given our life back to God in Jesus Christ? Is he Lord of our life? Do we belong? to the people of God. Okay, that is already three questions, but it is the same question really three times. Have we given our life back to God in Jesus Christ? Is he Lord of our lives? Do we belong to the people of God? When we fill out forms of application or whatever, we often have the option to answer, prefer not to say. I think we have that option this morning too. I am not coercing, controlling, overtly, inappropriately persuading or bullying you. But this is a really important question which affects us and others every day of our life on this earth and afterwards. Some of the older viewers this morning may be familiar with Detective Columbo played always by Peter Falk. Often when he had completed his questioning of a potential suspect, he then turned back and said, just one more thing. Well, Jesus is not a detective, but a loving friend. He asks us nevertheless critical and soul-searching questions. He knows our hearts through and through, inside out. Before we say something, he knows what we are thinking. He is saying finally to you and to me, do we know that we need him to forgive us our wrongs? All the mess we've ever made in our life through ignoring him and through taking all our decisions in our lives ourselves. Have we come to him, to Jesus Christ, for forgiveness? Are we committed to following the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we his disciples? Jesus said, follow me 13 times in the Gospels. He used these two simple words to call Peter, Andrew, James and John as his disciples. What is Jesus basically saying here? He is saying, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Maybe this sounds about as clear to you as a loudspeaker announcement on a foggy day on a cold, dark, wintry morning waiting for a train on an isolated station platform. So let me explain what Jesus means by being committed to him. It is a commitment to Jesus as a person, to Jesus as our Lord, and then to his message. We are not seeing Jesus as a more than average religious leader and aiming with all our strength to follow a humanistic ethical code for all men. The so-called sermon, sermon of the Mount is not for the world, but for his disciples. In Matthew 5 verses 1 to 2 we read, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. 
Jesus shows his humanity in sitting down after the climb, his lordship in speaking to those who are his disciples. Jesus speaks clearly and audibly. He will not leave us in any doubt as to who he is and what he expects from us. He will never leave us isolated and alone in an emotionally and or physically challenging situation. He is always there for us. He is only a prayer away. A cry from your heart always reaches him. He is always there for the broken-hearted. He heals the broken-hearted and he binds up their wounds. Yes, we may be hurt. We may be very hurt, but He is near. He is real. Let us leave our hurt behind us and go on with Him. Maybe you ask yourselves, Is it we who choose Jesus, or Jesus who chooses us? You did not choose me, says Jesus, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. What an amazing difference that makes. The God of all creation, the sustainer of the universe, has chosen us, has chosen me and you. Does this not increase, heighten our motivation and our awareness of our responsibility to serve him? If we are chosen like an athlete who is nominated to take part in the World Championships or in the Olympic Games, how strong will our sense of responsibility be to do our best for our country? If on the other hand we visit the Olympic Games as a tourist, we don't actually take an active part in anything. We can pick and choose which events we go to and look at. We can even sit at home and watch them live on our screens. Has anybody ever won an Olympic gold medal by sitting in front of a monitor or a television screen? No, not once. Athletes train hard for years, usually. They may give up everything to win the race. They experience disappointments, pain and suffering, disillusionment and personal attacks, political problems, and more recently and very intensively, the challenges of social media. I remember once, I think, receiving a sticker from the British consulate in Dusseldorf in Germany. On it were written the words, I am not a tourist, with a suggestion to place it in a prominent place. The background is that German citizens, knowing that Britons gladly visit the Rhine Valley, the Lorelei Rock, Heidelberg, the Black Forest and the Neuschwanstein Castle in Bavaria often greet Britons with the words Are you enjoying your holiday here? Forgetting that some Britons live and work in Germany on a regular and daily basis. Tourism is fine. Holidays when we can take them are great. But I am not basically a tourist in the kingdom of God. And I don't think you are either. We are soldiers of the king. Athletes running after the prize. It is striking that after saying to his disciples that we did not choose him, but he chose us, he immediately, straight away, directly, without entering onto another topic of conversation or teaching, says, This is my command. Love each other. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Perhaps we can grasp this more fully when we understand that he did not say things like, loving one another might be one way of seeing if you can get on together as a church. Or, loving another is one another is my suggestion for the start of the church, but if you see it doesn't work, you can try another way. Or, I think loving another is probably unrealistic for a church. After all, we're just human beings, so... Let's say this is an option which you can follow if you like. No, many times no. He says quite clearly and consciously, this is my command. Love each other. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. 
Alongside the inner power of the Holy Spirit, God wants us to experience the encouraging support of the love of other disciples of Jesus. It is in the strength of our relationships together in Christ that we can win the battles against the powers of darkness and help one another to fulfill the task that God has given us. It is only by loving one another that we will be able to be fruitful in his service and be effective in our prayers. As Matthew quotes, again I say to you, says Jesus, if two or of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Are we a member of the team? Are we part of the body that Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 12? Do we share the same goals, the same thinking and the same beliefs? Are we moving in the same direction? Paul says if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. The church, wrote Paul, is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. The hymn says the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul does not say it was their doctrine, their institution, or their religious activity which became the foundation of the church. Jesus called his disciples into a living, loving community. In the early church they worshipped together, prayed together, worked together, witnessed together, and as needs arose, shared their possessions together. The reality of their love for one another was a clear demonstration of the joy of their new individual and personal life in Jesus their Saviour. It had a massive, probably immeasurable impact on the world around them. In their commitment to one another, they became the visible demonstration of the body of Christ on earth. This is always for the people of God as a whole, not just for individuals who somewhere believe. It's when we dwell together in unity that the Lord commands his blessing. The church will never, ever be able to carry out a ministry of reconciliation when there are members within the body of Christ who are not willing and not prepared themselves to practice reconciliation. How can we talk about God reconciling us to himself through the death of Christ on the cross, giving us forgiveness for our wrongs, if we are not reconciled to one another? Anyone who doesn't love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. My personal opinion is that there is nothing that so effectively, so systematically, and so quickly and thoroughly destroys a church as unforgiveness. That's my opinion. If he is your Lord and my Lord, we are in the same team. But it is more than that. We are brothers and sisters. Let me rephrase that. It isn't as if because we are in Christ we are like brothers and sisters, but because we are all adopted children of God, sons and daughters of the King, that we are brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. If we want unity in the biblical sense, it will cost us our lives in our giving ourselves to the Lord and to each other. To do that, we need gentleness and humility, the fruit of the Spirit that work in us, in our lives and in the life of the Church. But there is no other way. Amen.